It's Palm Sunday. We celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I'm going to read Mark's gospel, if you'd care to turn with me there. Mark, gospel Mark, chapter 11. I'm going to read Mark's gospel record of this day as we begin this morning. Mark chapter 11, verse 1. Of course, Jesus has just uh, come through Jericho. He healed Bartimaeus, the blind man. Mark 11, 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found the colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those who were standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said. And they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who had followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And to that, Matthew actually inserts the words of the prophet Zechariah, Matthew 21, 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. When we think about celebrating Palm Sunday... We often associate the waving of palm branches, don't we? And the voices of people, people just like us, lifting our voices in praise and adoration, young and old, to the Lord. Hosanna, as we sang this morning, even as we have done. Those songs of worship call us back to these very words I just read from Mark's gospel. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king. I have a question. Was this event, that event on Palm Sunday, the end? Or was it the beginning? What do you think? It was the beginning. It was the beginning. Jesus entered Jerusalem as the prophet had foretold, riding on a donkey's foal or the colt of a donkey to the acclamations of the crowd, calling him a king. But just a few days later... What were the crowds crying out for? To crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas, the insurrectionist and murderer, in his place. And crucify him, the king of glory. But we know, right, that Jesus' crucifixion would not be his final or ultimate defeat. Rather, it would be his ultimate victory. (laughs) Amen? Amen a victory that would foreshadow his triumphant victory over all things. And with that said, today, actually, we're going to find ourselves this morning in the book of Revelation again. Turn with me now to the book of Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. So we have just seen and read the story that we well know of Palm Sunday. If I weren't to start there, chances are you would have thought, now, why didn't he read that text, right? Be honest. Why didn't he read that text? So I decided to start there, but we're aiming to end here. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. The backdrop of this text, I I believe, comes out of the Gospels, as just read from Mark's Gospel, where we find in Revelation now the real meaning that was, I believe, foreshadowed 2,000 years earlier by what we just, you know, by that passage there in the triumphal entry of Christ coming into Jerusalem that day to the acclaim of the crowd. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
But here in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, we see what I believe is Jesus' ultimate triumph as the king. Now re- follow along as I read now here from Revelation 19, 11. And then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, here in that passage, we really see the ultimate triumphal entry, do we not? The ultimate triumph of Jesus the King, the King of Kings that will happen one day when he returns in glory and great power. You know, I love the old hymn in the church, crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of he who died for me, for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king throughout eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands inside, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his burning eye at mystery so bright. Those words certainly are a reflection of what we just now read from Revelation. When Jesus comes back in power and glory, first of all, he will not come as a servant. He's going to come as a conqueror. When Jesus returns, he's coming as a conqueror, not as a servant savior. Not as a servant savior. And that's what we read here. I saw heaven open and one sitting on a white horse. Conquerors don't sit on donkeys. They sit on great stallions, white stallions, just like this. The white horse is an outstanding, magnificent steed, we could say, right? And the conqueror, Jesus the coming king, is sitting astride that horse. The one John sees here sitting on that horse is called faithful and true. You notice the proper nouns, you know, are often denoted, right, differentiated from regular nouns with the capital letter, right? Capital F, faithful. Capital T, true. The word of God in capitals. So see, these are proper, proper nouns, king of kings and lord of lords. These are, the, these are the marquee emblems of the one sitting on the white horse. He will come when he returns, not as a servant, but as a conqueror. Amen? He's coming back one day in glory and in power. Let's read again here. When I saw heaven open, behold, the white horse, the one sitting on it, is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. The absolute contrast that we see here in Jesus' name could not be more striking as uh, compared to what the epithets and accusations that were being hurled at him by the crowds way back when, in 2,000 years ago, even from now, looking back on those days following that entry into Jerusalem. They hurled accusations and incriminated him and judged him and then crucified him. They called Jesus a liar and a blasphemer, but he, in fact, is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, Jesus said. 
They stood in judgment over him, and they beat him and scourged him. But Jesus is the sovereign, righteous judge of all the earth. Indeed, here in this very chapter, Revelation 19, 1 and 2, John says this, After this I looked, I, I heard rather, what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. The people in the time of Jesus of Nazareth, who, Jesus who walked the earth, they called him a liar, they called him a blasphemer, because he had the audacity in their eyes to equate himself and call himself the Father. If you see me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. They, they repeatedly tried to assert their power against him. But Jesus withstood that because he's the sovereign, righteous judge of all the earth. Indeed, in Jesus' own explanation and words, if you were to look back with me to Matthew's gospel now, in Matthew chapter 25... Jesus is describing here the final judgment, Matthew chapter 25, and verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And if I may go on here a verse, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. If you look down at verse 41, he says to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, the fact of the matter is that the people in Jesus' day tried to stand in judgment over him. Pilate himself effectively did that very thing. But Jesus is is the one true judge, the judge of all the earth. And not only that, but then following that judgment at Pilate's seat, you know, where he sat on the pavement, as it's called, then they, what, the, what did they do? He turns them over to his soldiers, and in the midst of that beating that he took, they forced a twisted crown of sharp thorns onto his head. But he's crowned with many diadems, it says here, doesn't it? So we see the contrast yet, ade- yet again. Now, a diadem is a jeweled crown that's worn to symbolize sovereignty. That's what a diadem is. And so it says here, his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. His eyes are a flame of fire. That's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? John actually recorded something very similar to that. If you look back with Revelation 1 now, look at Revelation 1, verse 12. Revelation 1, 12, John has heard this voice behind him, like, a, like a, the voice of a trumpet, it says. And in verse 12, he says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead." But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, we say the Alpha and the Omega, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death in Hades. Those keys, of course, we know represent authority. Authority. How did Jesus acquire that authority? What happened? 
He died on the cross and arose from the grave. And the Bible says, therefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. Remember, Jesus stood with his disciples and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. That authority was given to him by the Father in heaven. He was exalted as both Lord and Christ, we know. Jesus is going to come one day, but when he comes back, he's going to be riding on a white horse as a conqueror. He is not coming back as a servant savior. He is clothed in a robe, it says, as we look here at verse 13. He's clothed in a robe that has been dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Early in Revelation, we looked at this verse last week, actually Revelation 5 verse 9, to the acclaim of the living creatures who fall down before him. They cry out in verse 9 of Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, he says. He's, he's dipped in a robe clothed in blood. Jesus is the coming king. He is the king. He is the righteous judge and the divine commander over all things. And his name is the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. John chapter 1 verse 1, right? When Jesus returns, he was he will be coming back as a conqueror, not as a servant savior. And secondly, when he returns, he will be a divine commander over the armies of heaven, a divine commander. With that, listen to what what we find recorded in the book of Joshua chapter 5. Just listen here. Joshua 5. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to him, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. No angel would require that. That's a... Jesus moment in the Old Testament. We call it a theophany. The coming of the commander of the host of the army of the Lord. The very thing that we now see here in Revelation chapter 19. When he comes back, he's not coming back as a servant king. He's come, servant savior rather. He's coming back as a commander. He's coming back as a divine commander over the armies of of heaven, and that's what we read here in verse 14. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Now, it's interesting because just earlier here in this very chapter, in verse 6, listen how it describes what it said there as the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19:6. And then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Listen, it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Verse 14. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Who's the army of the Lord? The bride of Christ. Clearly defined. Those associations cannot be overstated or dismissed. This is speaking about the the bride of Christ. Jesus is the commander and the king of his mighty army. And the army of the Lord is marshaled there in this passage here in Revelation 19 and outfitted with his army and arrayed in white 
and fine linen, which is said here, is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, we know that that could only be said of us because of the righteousness of Christ. We've considered this before. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. And so the righteousness of Christ is what's here seen to be fine white linen, bright and pure. That righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, because apart from that righteousness, all of our righteousness, as the Bible says, is as filthy rags. No one will ever come into the presence of Almighty God based on your own merit, achievement, or self-righteousness. None, ever, because only those whose hands are clean and whose hearts are pure can ever come and stand in the presence of God. Psalm 24, right? We looked at that last week. And so we see this great army, the army of heaven, following the conqueror, the commander of the host, at coming in, coming before them, leading them into this battle. And it says here that from his mouth, verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. From his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, which he is using in this battle, in this moment. With, with it, it says, with which he strikes down the nations, the godless people who are under the domain of the enemy. In fact, there in Revelation 19, 21, the last verse here of this chapter, and the rest, it says, were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And so we know that was the, the whole execution of the judgment of God in this moment. And once again, it, the, the contrast between Jesus, the humble servant, depicted in the Synoptic Gospels, coming into Jerusalem particularly, he now comes doing what? He's wielding a mighty weapon, the sword with which to strike down who would dare stand against him. The shepherd's staff is also here not listed as a a wooden thing like you depict a a humble shepherd guiding some sheep along the hillside in a serene, beautiful, you know, idyllic kind of a setting. No, the shepherd's staff is now depicted as what? A rod of iron with which Jesus now rules over the nations. And the rod of iron, yet again, in this apocryphal literature, is a symbol of the Lord's absolute authority and his unrivaled power to reign and to rule. To reign and to rule. So we see the sharp sword with which he uses to strike down those who would oppose him. We see the the rod of iron which is in his hand, which he's ruling over the nations. Okay, his unrivaled power. And then it says here that he will, the third phrase in this little verse, he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Now, if you recall back, Jesus leaves the upper room and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he, he, he turns to this father in prayer. And what does he ask for? You remember? Father, if it's possible... Let this cup pass from me. Let this cup be taken away. And he goes back. The disciples have fallen asleep. Couldn't you stay awake even for an hour, he says to them. And then he returns. Then he prays something else. He says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Thank God Jesus said that. For were it not for the fact that Jesus submitted himself, then no one could be saved. Because he was the only one that could. Amen? Thank God he submitted himself that day to the Father. And now here in, in this passage, Revelation nineteen fifteen, John writes, he, tr- he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. It's interesting because now he's not going to bear that wrath. He's going to be the one treading in the wine press of that wrath. You know what a wine press is? How many of you know what a wine press is? 
in ancient times, it could be a big a cylindrical stone you know, structure in which they would put olives when it was time for the ho- olive harvest to make, you know, like uh, good um, you know, olive oil. There it is. Or grapes during the grape harvest from the vine. Interestingly, Jesus used that imagery again as a metaphor for Israel, the vine, right? And himself, the true vine, you know, John 15. So here we see Jesus now not enduring and taking the wrath at the cross upon. Now he says, he, when he comes back, he's going to be the one treading that wine press of the wrath of the fury of God, the Almighty. And I found a, came upon a, in my study, a passage that is somewhat perhaps obscure. And I, uh, the Lord kind of drew my heart, my attention to it. And I, it's found in the, in the prophet Isaiah chapter 63. If you care to, you're welcome to turn there. If not, I'll just read here. Isaiah 63, 1. Who is this who comes from Edom, is crimsoned in crimsoned garments from Bozrah, he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood was splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled but there was no one to uphold. And so my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their life blood on the earth. Folks, that is a prophetic foretelling of the coming of this moment recorded for us here in Revelation 19. When that's what Jesus is coming to do, Jesus' substitutionary atonement at the cross was indeed a, what we call a propitiatory sacrifice. And that's an important big word. It's important for us to understand the meaning and the, and, and the, the significant intention and implication of that propitiation that was offered for our sin. Because in that, Jesus not only died on the cross, but he suffered God's wrath in our place there. And he bore that wrath for those of us, we who have trusted in him for salvation, he bore the wrath of God for our sins once and for all time. And again, the book of Hebrews is one of my favorite New Testament letters. And in Hebrews chapter 9, it speaks about the redemption through the blood of Christ here. Hebrews nine eleven. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing for us an eternal redemption. For if, and go, if I may go on here, for if the blood of goats, of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Down in verse 26, for he goes on to say here, but as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. From his mouth comes a sharp sword from with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And so having drank the the cup of God's wrath of sin himself, now Jesus is the one who is treading the winepress of the fury of God's wrath 
God the Almighty and executes God's righteous and holy justice on sinners. And when Jesus returns, again, he is not coming back as a, as a servant savior. He's coming back as a conqueror. When he comes back, he's coming back as a divine commander over all the armies of heaven. And one last thing, when he returns in power and glory, he is going to be declared the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Here we find it in verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of of Lords, you know. Again, reflecting back, the acclamation of the crowds on that Palm Sunday, two thousand years ago. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the the coming King. You know, and so forth. As Myron alluded to this morning, they wanted a political ruler. The people of that day expected a coup to overthrow the emperor in Rome. But Jesus' purpose was far more than that. (laughs) He came to be the king, not just another king, not just another emperor. And the only way that he could accomplish that was to do the very thing that he, in fact, did. He went to the cross. And then he arose on the third day. We We recall that acclamation, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And now we can truly, really understand as we look through the lens of John the Apostle here in Revelation, looking back on that day. And Jesus is exalted in glorious splendor, and he has this royal robe inscribed with the words, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His triumphant return, the return of the king, to take a phrase from Tolkien, is then shown to be the preamble of a great battle. Let's look at that now, these verses, verse 17 to the end of the chapter. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Jesus' triumphant return is seen here. And the battle scene is, that we see is really not much of a battle, is it? It appears as though the, the, the armies have marshaled the host of the beast and the false prophet. They've, they've marshaled themselves in a great array against the army of the king of glory and it on, seated on that white horse. The battle scene is no contest at all because none can withstand the coming of the king and the coming of the Lord of, of glory. The enemies of God may indeed feign to make war against him, but their defeat is certain, and their destruction will ultimately be an everlasting destruction. Why? Because nothing can withstand him. If you look into the next chapter, we read about what's called the thousand-year reign of of Christ. Because in the early first verses, we see the, that great dragon, the ancient serpent, Satan, the devil, bound for a thousand years, thrown into the abyss. There's a thousand year reign. And down in verse 7, let's look here, Reve, Revelation 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather for them for battle, and their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. 
And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Again, the armies of the host of the enemy marshaled against the Lord of glory, the king, but the one who is the sovereign ruler of all things will not even be trifled with in that regard. There's no battle. There looks like there's going to be a battle, but what happens? Fire comes down and consumes them. Boom. One shot, so to speak, and it's over. It's all over. And the devil is thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever. Friends, when Jesus comes back, he's coming as a conqueror, not as a servant savior. He's coming as the divine commander over all the armies of heaven. And on that day, he is going to be declared the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The annual celebration of Palm Sunday filled with the sounds of praises to the Lord Jesus is but a foretaste of his certain return in power and great glory. And his eyes are a flame of fire. And he is crowned with many diadems, crowned with many crowns. And if I may, just read a couple more stanzas from that wonderful old hymn. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of lords, who, o'er all, who over all doth reign, who once on earth the incarnate word for ransomed sinners slain, now lives in realms of light, where saints with angels sing their songs before him day and night, their God, Redeemer, King. Crown him the Lord of heaven, enthroned in worlds above. Crown him the King, to whom is given the wondrous name of love. Crown him with many crowns as thrones before him fall. Crown him, ye kings, with many crowns, for he is king of all. Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, we just thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father God, and we give you praise and glory and honor today. Father, as we await that great day, the the crowning day, the day when the trumpet call of God will resound in the heavens and every eye will see you descending in power and glory from heaven to summon the saints to yourself forever, Lord God. Lord, we look to that day. We rejoice even in knowing that that day is coming, that no matter what troubles and hardships and struggles and and plates of, of plague, of cancer, or whatever, any disease that could ever affect us here in this place, Lord, even to the point of being slain, Lord God, none of those things can overthrow your great power, Lord. We know, Lord God, that we are safe in the arms of Jesus. We know, Lord God, that you are the everlasting hope of glory of all, over all things. We know, Lord Jesus, that one day, Father, in Jesus, because of our faith and hope in you, because we have been redeemed, having placed our faith in you, Lord God, we know that we have that everlasting hope. But we also know that that very day will be an awful day for those who have rejected you, Lord. It will be a terrible day, a day of woe for the multitude of humankind who even now choose to disdain you and reject you. Oh, Lord God, I pray that if there are ones here today that have never surrendered their hearts to Christ, today would be that day. Lord, that you would move in your grace and power by your Holy Spirit upon their hearts today, even now in this very moment, Lord, convict them of their sin and lead them by faith through repentance to Christ and kneel at the foot of the cross, Lord give themselves to you. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would be merciful today to those that are here this morning, that are still outside the boundary of your, of your redemption, or even as we do rejoice 
as the redeemed, we know that so many of our loved ones and friends are with outside, outside that boundary. They will be those that, whose lives will be stricken down one day. Oh, God, we pray for mercy for them. We ask, Lord God, for those in our own families who, who don't know you. Father, as, Father, I just pray for your merciful hand, Lord God. To call them to yourself, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord God, how great you are, how magnificent you are, Lord Jesus. May we live to declare your glory. May our lives just radiate the, the sunbeam of your light into such a dark world. Help us, Father, to share and shine the light of Christ in our words and our attitudes and our in our lives every day, Lord God. For you are the Redeemer, the conquering King, the coming Savior. We praise you, our King and our Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.